Good morning and welcome to the CAD Class Podcast. I'm Josh. I'm Jake. And each week we talk about all things CAD, 3D printing, and making. And Jake, we have some awesome projects to share with you all. Dude, it has been a busy, busy, busy week. Holy hell, you guys have posted so much this week. It is so much fun to see. It's easily our favorite part about doing what we like to do is just seeing what you guys make, the creativity that comes out of here. It's just so phenomenal. I, I get asked. I always like, love seeing it. I always get asked, like, what are you making? And I and my answer has remained pretty much consistent for the past years. It's like I I help make makers. And I want that our audience fair, yeah. to be making amazing stuff. Like, so what am I making? Hopefully I'm making you a maker. <laughs> it's just a very elaborate way to say that all the cool things that you guys make, we get to put our little <laughs> fingerprints on it. But like, I mean, I technically didn't make it. Someone else made it, but you know, I helped them. It's a little bit of that. So Jake, I think let's dive right in. We talked, we were talking about just we 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 veer too much in the beginning away from cool stuff. So let's dive right in yeah. to the I made a thing, which is what we're talking about right here, because we have some really, really cool stuff. So I think some of my favorite stuff that I've seen uh in quite a long time, to be honest. Uh let's get on to our Discord page. <laughs> PC Van Vliet. Sure, you guys can take the credit for our work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I take you know none of the credit for your work, but I take I take a I take a fair bit of the credit for the inspiration. <laughs> That's <laughs> or or maybe not even the inspiration. But the, uh... <laughs> uh... Awesome. Um, I I think the last thing we talked about uh, last week was uh, Cadence's uh, really kick-ass design uh, for the remote Amazing. control for her yep. uh, soccer battle bots, which is just like super duper simple, super rad. Just love to see that kind of stuff. Um, I haven't seen some of the stuff down here. Um, one other thing, my brother came to town uh, disassembling a blast header. So this is, what is this? Uh, bead blasting. Ah, okay. So yeah, it took three minutes from opening Fusion uh, and getting it done. This is one of the really beautiful bits of CAD that I know I talk about all the time. But it's like, it's really rad to make cool figurines and things that look cool with 3D printing. That's obviously the main point of it. But when people immediately start to think about it as a tool to recreate things that are broken and fix things, and it is infinitely easier to model something up, measure it, model it, 3D print it, and kind of see that it works, it is so much easier and so much more efficient in a manufacturing sense than going out and buying it because God knows how long that would take to ship and for you to find exactly what part it is. So this is just... I, I just love this stuff, even though it's like super simple. And I know people from outside the 3D printing and CAD world coming in to go, well, it's just a little adapter. It's like, no, dude, that's everything. It's just an <laughs> adapter now. But it like that stuff builds up very, very quickly. I, I know. I, I think I, I think remove the word just and like it's a it's like you don't need a modifier. Like if you've made a thing, no matter how simple mm -hmm. supposedly the thing is like, that's rad. That's totally cool. Yeah. By the uh, way, and then Sam um, let me let me just quickly shout out who's here. So hey Sam, PC Van Vliet, Aaron, Spitfire, which um I can't remember Spitfire's <laughs> name here. <laughs> uh, PC Van Vliet, which we may have said, Maple Leaf Makers, Joe Stree. I think I've gotten everybody in the chat, so hop back into it. Oh, Maple yeah, I said Maple Leaf Makers. I think I got everybody down there. So welcome everybody. It's, it's going, really everyone? so nice to see you every week. All right, continue on, Jake. Uh, and then another thing that Sam made, uh, a prototype for, uh, what is it? Here is the prototype of the rest wax tool going to remove the point and make it for a mold to make with silicon. I have no idea what that is. I think I you said ear, what, what do you mean rest wax? It says ear wax, no? Rest wax tool. Here's a prototype for the rest wax tool. I don't right. know if I this is something like a... else that he made previously, but if he's going to then silicon mold it and cast it with something, that's pretty cool. There is There is something really satisfying about resin print or molding and then casting a 3d printed part because obviously the silicone picks up all the layer lines and then when you cast it obviously it still looks identical to the original 3d print um but then as soon as you try and flex it and there's just no break whatsoever but it's just infinitely complicated it's way way more difficult than something you'd ever try to make uh with traditional manufacturing that's just rad love to see it um what else did we get uh, recently stripped some gears on a pet toy, learned some few things uh, in the first chapter, and finally made them, printed them in nylon. 
again, this is something that I really dig, where you have something that you bought, it broke, you know exactly what it is. It's a relatively simple part, geometrically speaking, and you can recreate it and 3D print it. And then you can save that item from 100,000 years of landfill. Um, and he's printing it in, in nylon. And this is something that, uh, it's a material that I've never printed with. And I kind of want to chat with you a little bit, Josh, because I hear yeah. a ton of people that come into 3D printing and they're still hearing information from like 10 years ago where they go, PLA is only for artistic models and that's it. And ABS is a really strong thing. And it's like, we've moved so far past that. So well, I, 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 so yeah, yeah. So go on. I, I, the, P, so, so PLA, it, the funny thing about PLA is it's not just one thing. I think that's like, that's a misconception right from the start. Polylactic acid is not all created the same. So PLA, PLA plus, manufacturer to manufacturer, like the specs actually are different. And when you add yeah. another material to it and it becomes PLA plus, is it still PLA? It's like, it's not at all obvious where these lines are. And so there's, there's constant progress in the, in the world of material science where people are making yeah. these stronger and stronger and stronger and they're adding and editing the properties. And even from batch to batch, these things change. So I think mm -hmm. one area of confusion is to think that each type of filament is exactly the same because it's called PLA. And you have to kind of recognize like, no, these are, these are not the same thing. What do you think about that? The other, the other thing that not a lot of people know about is when you hear these words, PLA plus, PLA Ultra, PLA Tough. These are all brand names. None of these are actual real products. They're just alloys. They're PLA and another type of plastic that's been mixed together. And PLA is the most common 3D printing plastic on the planet. Therefore, that gets the name. So it is usually a lot stronger. Um, but it's still the ease of use of PLA to work with. What ends up tend to happening is that, just as Josh said, depending on the additives that you get, it changes the chemistry, obviously, but it changes the physical capabilities as well. If you are printing with silk PLA, which uh, in 3D printing world just means shiny, so <laughs> gold, silver, bronze, shiny red, shiny blue, etc., um, that's going to be significantly more brittle. It needs a much higher printing temperature. It's a slippery material, so you need to tweak your 3D printer's extrude a little bit for it. Uh, if you're printing with a matte material, it actually has particulates that are abrasive, so it's going to mess with your nozzle a little bit. So it may be strong on the bottom, but it'll wear out your nozzle for a large print. So then the top is going to have a lower flow rate, therefore it's less strong. So there's so many weird different things that are going on uh, with just saying one material, is it strong or is it not? But as far as like the past misconceptions about plastics, PLA is now incredibly strong. It's still a brittle material. So if you have something that you make really strong and you put a ton of stress into it and it breaks, it shatters. Uh, sometimes those shatters go into you, which sucks. Um, but it's much stronger than it used to be. Uh, ABS, I don't think anyone uses ABS anymore. Uh, and um, we have Maple Leaf yeah. Makers talking about ABS. He says, at least for ABS, the plus usually means weaker and poor layer adhesion, but easier to print. So there you go. Sometimes like you can't like pluses, the, the whole branding side of this stuff gets really funky. And I, I think that's also a big point here is if you're into 3D printing, if you're into CAD and you're making things for yourself, what you really are somewhat is a kind of a, a student of material science. You're trying to Absolutely. figure out how does the, how does the material... I'm currently working with behave in the machine that I have and what do I need to do to put those two things together? And by the way, that influences heavy, heavily the design in CAD because Jake, I think you're pretty good at this. You studied plastic manufacturing techniques for how do I strengthen my part from an injection molding standpoint and then kind of reverse those into some of the part design that you do inside of Fusion 360 so that when you make your final part, you're like, well, I know it's going to be weak in parts. And mm -hmm. I know it because of this, and I know how to strengthen that because of the material science that I've studied, because of the injection molding techniques that I've studied. Yeah. And it's it's obviously changing based on design, based on slice settings, based on material. Um, if you design, or I, I can change around a design in CAD or in, uh, in my printer settings to make a PLA part stronger than an ABS part. But obviously it would use more material and it would be slightly heavier. So this, it's always a 
weird balance based on the material that you have on hand. Um, I just saw someone say uh, that the Voron, uh, the Voron uses parts it's, made of ABS. Totally it's still, true. ABS yeah, it's still, is a really strong material. It's Comma. much higher melting point, right? Mm -hmm. Much higher melting what, point. What is the Comma. melting point of ABS? I think it's two two twenty. Two, I believe two twenty one. Yep. Nice. Wow. And then a Very good. and then a uh, and then a it, it needs a heated enclosure. So printing it on just a stock three D printer, like most of us have, where it's kind of open to the air, it just won't work. You get a huge amount of layer uh, layer separation where none of the layers want to stick to each other because it needs to be in an oven essentially that needs to be about sixty degrees Celsius um, or like. An like egypt essentially i would actually love to print abs in egypt in an open air printer that sounds you, like a ton of fun did do, do you know i don't think i knew the chemical name for abs do you know the chemical name for abs acrylate a, a, no acrylonitrile yes acrylonitrile butadiene styrene styrene so it's yeah so polystyrene is probably the closest styrene i can think of and then it's got. Sorry, really quick. Uh, for anyone actually... that doesn't know, Josh, Josh in a previous lifetime was a uh, a very very good chemist, uh, a pharma chemist to be exact. That is he uh, knows far too generous. I actually chemistry. think I was a bad chemist, but I did I do disagree. a fair bit of it. <laughs> um, there's um, ABS is amorphous, so it actually has no true melting point. Another fun fact for you. Really? Yeah. Weird. So interesting. And then I see uh, new favorites. Our technical stuff is. PC blend. What PC Van Vliet? What is PC blend? Do you know what PC blend PC is? PC is polycarbonate, so super, oh, super strong. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Um it has, as far as I know, it has a fairly high glass temperature. Glass points is the uh the material science point where things become floppy. It's 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 a roughly not scientific, but sometimes scientific word. Um, it basically just means where things go from solid to flexible, but they aren't liquid. Uh, and so, for example, if you are trying to dehydrate or dry your filament, you want to set your oven to the glass temperature because anything past that and it starts to get a little oozy and your filaments tend to melt into each other. But just below that glass temperature, everything is not going to adhere to each other but it's going to be hot enough to dry out all the moisture from your filament. Um, so PC has a fairly high uh, melting temperature. Um, you can tell it's PC uh, in the sh <clears throat> in the sheet form if it has uh, a certain amount of like purple hue to it. So if anyone has seen like Lamborghinis or Ferraris, their windscreen because glass is really heavy, they make it out of polycarbonate. So it's actually a plastic. And before it goes through any shaping process, they actually have to put it in this gigantic kiln to heat it up to get it even a little bit flexible or else it just burns. And as far as I know, it can set on fire quite easily as well. Um, but yeah, that's what most uh, most glasses are made out of as well. These are polycarbonate. These are no longer glass. Uh, <laughs> so are safety glasses. I remember going uh... to shops and people were like, you need to wear safety glasses. I'm like, we're all wearing safety glasses. It's just some of us are a little <laughs> bit more stylish. That's it. <laughs> um, yeah, but polycarbonate, super good uh, for 3D printing. It can be a little bit expensive because it's kind of hard to find. Uh, same thing with ASA. I saw someone talk about it uh, before as well. ASA, super, dumb, super duper fun material to play with. But again, it's a little bit hard to find, which means that it has comparable strength values to other filament but it's more expensive. And so a lot well, of Well, you got to be a little forward. careful with ASA. I think there's some toxicity. Same with ABS. Like you need to ventilate your room yeah. well if you're printing yeah. on ABS and it, and you also need to do the same if you're printing with ASA. Uh, and there's a, the material safety properties yeah. vary widely. And I've heard I mean the you really can't smell PLA, but I'm sure it's still emitting some it fumes has a, over time. It has a slightly sweet smell. Um PLA is a bioplastic, so it's made from corn, soy, or cotton uh uh material essentially that's where it comes from uh and so if it comes from corn it's ever so slightly sweet but you can't really tell what it's from and it, when it's in so, its super simple chemi chemical form. so knowledge bomb on here so i was saying you know not all filament yeah. is created equally so the i'm looking at the abs i'm just reading the wikipedia page now and it's a it's it's a tur polymer so it includes styrene acrylonitrile and polybutadiene which is the where that name actually comes from 
And <laughs> but the proportions vary. So it's from 15 to 35 percent acrylonitrile, 5 to 30 percent butadiene, and 40 to 60 percent styrene. It is a gigantic variation. And this is exactly my point. This is why when you buy filament from different manufacturers, this is why I think people get so fixated on buying filament from a single supplier because they know that when they've purchased that filament from the supplier at least they hope they know that the manufacturing technique is consistent and they're getting the exact same thing every time so this is why when you purchase new filament you may not have the same results even if it's like still matte filament and even sometimes if it's the same company if they don't have the quality control yeah. standards actually worked out so the the proportions vary and this is exactly what we were talking about early on that's why one of our one of our tips for people just getting into 3D printing is just to eliminate one of the variables that comes into the mess of learning 3D printing is just buy from one manufacturer from one and, brand. And and more than that, one color, one color, one, yeah, one, color, one you know. filament, one style, just buy one. <laughs> because then you can eliminate that as a variable. Then it's like, okay, when you work when you're dealing with 3D printing, it's either your printer, it's either the hardware, it is either the filament. Sometimes it's just bad filament, diff crappy changes diameters, which fluctuates flow and gives you crappy effects. Um, or it's your slicer settings. And if you can, if you have two different printers and you test the same file on two different machines, then you can eliminate the hardware. If you try multiple different filaments, then you can get and you get the same results. Then you know it's not the filament. Then you can kind of whistle it down uh, into the hardware. But uh, going back to the reason I wanted to talk about this. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Jake. <laughs> Uh, printing with nylon, uh, that's that's kind of a, a an advanced material. I've actually never. That's one of the few materials I've never printed with. Um, nylon is really tricky for anyone that wants to play around with nylon. Uh, with nylon, absolutely. <laughs> what is it? Nylon. Sorry, um, not, I'm going to print some nylon. nylon. You said nylon, nylon, but you you know, like you first failed. I you know, I'm just I'm just. You know. Yeah, that's what you're here for. Um, uh, nylon is unbelievably hygroscopic vastly more than any other filament uh hygroscopic means that it is absorbing moisture most notably from the air so all 3d printing filaments all of them absorb some moisture uh and then when it goes through a hot end that converts to steam and in extreme situations that really makes your prints look like a foam it's when you hear like little crackles in the hot end uh especially with tpu dry tpu versus wet tpu uh, is like a world of difference. Uh, nylon Maple Leaf Maker says nylon will absorb, is the worst. <laughs> yeah, will absorb so much more moisture than anything else. I believe it's the number one. Um, <laughs> PC event fleet. I'm known to be hygroscopic just, in bars. <laughs> me too. Um, it is. I I believe there's some nylons that NASA uses because they're so unbelievably strong, but it has a airtime. Like, how long can this filament be in the open air, which is like a normal humidity, until it becomes ruined? And it is about like five seconds. So you need to print it while the material is in a dry box or in a, uh, a dehydrator, going into a PTFT, uh, PTFE tube, and then into the hot end. So it doesn't experience any air anywhere through it, and then it prints beautifully. Uh, but yeah, I have not touched nylon because it's very expensive and I don't need to. If I was, if I needed something out of nylon, that's where I'd go to like a 3D printer hub, like send, cut, send, and I would just like, I need this. Can I order it? Uh -huh, oh, yeah, sure. uh -huh, uh -huh, and they do uh -huh. all the hard work for me. Um, really quick, before we talk about the Prusa, which is literally sitting <laughs> right here on my desk right here. Um, oh, oh, geez. Teasing the Prusa. It's very heavy. Um, uh, I do just want to go back to the I made a thing very, very yes, quickly please. because there's some yes, really, yes, truly yes, magnificent yes. things. Yes. Uh, yes. Uno momento, por favor. Um, uh, it is so, have... so, so nice to see these familiar faces every week. We are so thankful yeah, for you all. I, every you. time I look at the comment section, I'm like, I recognize all of you. This is awesome. Yes. Yeah. Um, this may be my most favorite Let project me... to see that I've Can seen. Can I introduce do. Dorian? Yes, absolutely. So Dorian. Is, I'm just going to do a uh, quick slideshow of this while you talk. Please do. So Dorian was in a program called Roseville Rising, which we did here. And it's a uh, it's a city just one adjacent to Sacramento. And the city of Roseville puts on a program that to help students bring ideas to life. So they do entrepreneurial stuff. And we ended up running a program with CAD class in combination with Roseville Rising, where we taught kids CAD. Now, I cannot 
say that I taught Dorian CAD. Dorian already knew CAD coming into this program. He was already <laughs> really good. But I believe he's, and hopefully he watches this podcast and can correct me later. I think he's only 16 or 17 years old. But he did this entire build at home in one week. And he had CAD the entire thing up beforehand. He did it in one week? One week. If you read oh that post right God. there, it talks about, yeah, having having done that in one week. Two weeks Dorian. Ago, uh, and he's entrepreneurial. He's selling one week. one week. He's entrepreneurial. He's selling stuff online. He's he's phenomenal at CAD wow. modeling. I think he's got a, an extremely bright future ahead of him. And it's just neat to see that that talent exists in high schools oh, here. Because you know, there's like, I'm gonna rant for a second. Four hours of CAD rant. work. There's there's a lot of people that say you know high schools are failing and they're you know they're bad and like teach like teachers get a lot of flack for it and there's all this stuff. And while I think. There are things that are that can be improved. Um, I see examples like this, and I'm like, well, we're not, you know, it's not all terrible. Like, clearly something is going right. And even if that means Dorian is finding this information on his own, and he's seeking out the opportunities that he 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 has near him, and it's like his own self drive. I still think there's a ton of opportunity for young students in this in in the U.S. and and worldwide for that fact. And and you know, you can get this information for free online. You can teach yourself whatever you want. It's like. Anyways, into my rant. I don't know where I was going with that. Just to say no, that no, it's, it's that not all bad inside of high schools. That was a beautiful sentiment. The, the world is actually still still quite good. And there's uh, a tremendous amount of young people who are just so, so clever at making rad things I'd, that we all love to see. This is so cool. Okay, so so really quick. Um, uh, so he said that he did this in four hours of CAD, made a basic um, basic guitar body, LED, custom colors. Uh, I just want to look at this really, really quick. So it looks like he made the actual body of the guitar uh, out of wood. That looks... He did. C Is that CNC'd? That looks CNC'd. Um, I don't think Maybe. so. I think he actually... I'm, I'm not sure if it's... Actually, it might be CNC'd. It does really... It's either CNC'd or template. It, I, it looks CNC'd. Point, yeah. um, he, but I he's mean, got a making... He's got a video up of it on YouTube. So you can pop in and I see will, it. Everyone should subscribe to this boy. Um... <laughs> yeah, all these connected bolts. This is just rad. This it's is really, so really, really, good. really cool. Um, and then just chucking in some LEDs. I, amazing. Uh, making amazing. guitar is one of, is one of the things that I do want to make. Um, just in general. Unfortunately, I uh, <laughs> I have no idea how to play guitar. I don't have the most dexterous fingers in the world, and so I'm pretty crap at acoustic guitar. I've never even thought about playing the, the piano because i know i'm just gonna be awful at it um much more of a drummer myself um <laughs> but holy god amazing this is amazing work phenomenal. dorian uh Hats cadence by the me. way cadence says one of my volunteers is 16 and his fusion work is amazing i these i, I, I think they I bet. the the younger this kids are realizing they have by the way oh thousand percent i mean i can't i'm so excited to share all these projects in the book um, a thousand percent agree. So the volunteer is 16. His fusion work is amazing. There is something about, I think students now, and if anybody's listening, who's in middle school, in high school, in grade school, something like that, you have so many opportunities at your fingertips online. You can grab our book for free. You can learn this stuff on your own. You can go to YouTube. It's like school. I'm going to go back to the school thing really quickly. School's almost unnecessary if you're motivated, if you're motivated and you want to figure something out, and you want to learn something. It's like, you have access to the world's resources at your fingertips. I would say use your school as a resource. Go to your teachers and say, mm -hmm. I want to learn more about this. What do I do? But man, the sky is the limit for people coming up now. There, there are some teachers that I have had in the past, which I never did, but I, I really wish I would have gone up to them and said, I'm really fascinated about in this topic in calculus or in this engineering field or this and that. Where should I go? And I never did. And I really wish I did. I, um, I have a quick even story Even in college. For you. I, all right, hit me. I have a quick story for you. So I was studying pharmacy in college. And I, I had worked in a pharmacy for three years and decided I did not want to work at the equivalent of McDonald's passing out medicines. And I was like, this is not really the field I want to pursue. It's not quite for me. I'm right? a little bit little more entrepreneurial. I want to make things. And I my, my the end of my junior year, I decided I want to do research, but I don't know who to do research with. So I went up to my favorite professor. He was a he was a uh, pharmaceutical chem he was a medicinal chemistry professor. I went up to him after class and I just said, "Hey, you're my favorite teacher. 
I've enjoyed this class tremendously. You have a right all the all the glowing things, which were true. Um, I want to do research, and I'll do it on anything. I just I want to get involved in some research. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to start. Can you help me? And he said, you know what? Maybe. Uh, come back to me next. This was like a Friday. He said, come back to me on Monday on our next class. Uh, I'll chat with some of my grad students. We'll see. Monday, he said, I got a spot for you. Can you come up on Wednesday? And on Wednesday, I met my mentor, who Jean Fauti, shout out Jean, I'm sure he's not listening, but Jean Fauti is Cameroonian guy, was a phenomenal chemist. And he basically put me under the tutelage of, of him and said, just go work with him. He'll direct a project for you. I ended up writing a senior thesis on it. I won a couple scholarships for it. I got my last semester of college paid, um, all because I went up to the professor and just said, do you have opportunities? I really like what your style, basically. So, you know, hopefully that inspires people here to just go ask people if you want something. Yeah. So anyways, Jake, I think I interrupted you Let's... a little bit, but that was an exciting story. Oh, no, 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 no. That, that's the kind of stuff I love to see. That I love to see. Um, I think we do have one less project to check out on the uh, I Made a Thing. Uh, yeah. Oh, we actually have a few. Uh, Mr. Mitnick, uh, also working on a new project for my neighbor. I'd love to see a shrine for his PS5 as we could help me out. Um... Oh, it's like an entire thing. Oh, I didn't even see the size of it. Oh, that's great. So a shrine for his PS5. <laughs> that's pretty good. I'm not sure what, what this is in relation to this. I might be totally dumb. I think, it. in fact, I'm sure I am. Um, but that's rad. Oh, print it out. That's awesome. Oh, this was a project that I uh, that I actually did want to answer really quick. Uh, so this was a project that came up um, on Reddit a few weeks ago, where it's essentially a wall-mounted owl, and it has all these cutouts. And as soon as you shine a light behind it, it essentially looks just like this, where it's like light wings. Super, super cool. Uh, and Mr. Mitnick just had a really quick uh, question. Uh, I saw someone that you could uh, do these lights with a lofting tool. Any ideas on how this would work? And yeah, this is actually a really good example of lofting to a point. So you can think of an LED somewhere in the middle is like a singular point of light where light is coming off absolutely evenly. Obviously, it's not perfect like that, but that is a way to think about it. Uh, and if you just take all of these profiles, all of these uh, kind of cutout shapes, and loft it to a single central point, then all of the light that's going to be coming off of that is going to be directed nice and neatly. It's not going to have any corners to interfere with, any shadows. Uh, it's actually fairly easy. Um, if you need any uh, practice with this, this would be a kick-ass project on it. And it's the same technique that we used uh, when we made the surfboard, where we lofted between multiple profiles and a singular point. So that would actually be a really, really super cool project to see. Uh, and then while we were talking, uh, uh, Andre just came up with this, Adventures with Joints, which I have not seen So yet. Andre is um, uh, Maple Leaf Makers, for those of you who are curious. Can you guys see Look the video on my screen? That. Yes. This is That's yes. So kick ass. This is oh so rad. So I have so no so idea rad. What this is? This looks like a piston. Andre, if you are still hanging around, tell us, dude. What are we? What rad, are we looking at? Rad, what rad. Are we? It's a yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, we'll see. We'll see if you're still popping around yeah. in here. Before that's you pop off of Discord permanently, oh. um, can uh, it's it's oh that's the ping pong ball launcher that he mentioned. <gasps> oh. Of course, I, yes. I so much want to see this. Um, maybe we should talk offline, Andre. I would love to actually put together a step-by-step -step project for this when you're done. I just, yeah, just because it would be super cool. fun to do it. So if you want to collaborate on a step-by-step -step project, ping pong launcher, when you've got it dialed in and it works, I just think that would be so That's freaking fun. Awesome. Yes. Uh, can you pop up one more page really quickly, Jake? I yeah. want to just show off something to everybody here. I think you all have probably seen it already, but we've put the resources page up. Can you just pop over to the resources page? Uh, yep. So I... Uh, this is just on the left-hand side, just below the information. So in the information section, and just blow that up full screen so that we can see everything here. I just wanted to point out that um, I'm now trying to put everything that we have that may be relevant. Well, this is awkward. <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to put everything that we have in one section so that you guys can all um, so that you guys can all find information that you're looking for related to content that we've produced, uh, social media stuff, kind of whatever it happens to be. So if you have any question or can't find something or trying to find a link to somewhere that we have, I'm going to try to constantly update that 
uh, with new and improved information. So do pop over there if you have something you need to find. All right. Good. Plug over. Not bad. Yep. All right. Uh, let me kill this. Stop sharing that. There we go. Um, yeah. And then uh, next week, uh, we're going to be going on. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, Robert, is it Robert Fenerak? Or am I totally butchering? F- Fenerak, Fenerak, I think. I'm, I'm not Fenerak. 100% sure how to pronounce I, it. So sorry, Robert. <laughs> um, he has asked us to essentially make uh, a really cool 3D printable case uh, for a Raspberry Pi Pico. Have right here. Um, he's done some projects in the past where he has really kick ass. Uh, little 3D printable electronic projects, which we always love to see. I'm just gonna I'm just um, gonna paste his info here, and I'm gonna go ahead and yeah. show it on the screen so that you all can interact with him if you'd like. Uh, for uh-huh. everyone that doesn't know, this is a Raspberry Pi. This is essentially a micro computer. Is that a good way to think about it? It's a micro mm-hmm. control. Um, it's like a, it's a computer. A ras- it's, a, it's a little computer. It's like an Arduino. Easiest way to think of it. It's like an Arduino, and then a level up. Um, mm-hmm. But this is a smaller version where it just has a USB micro attachment on it. But this is used to do uh, lots of really cool uh, 3D printing projects, electronics projects. Um, but as you can imagine, a single chip just floating in air is not going to be super duper protected. So we're going to be doing a little. Uh, I don't think it's going to be live, uh, but a little project with him. Uh, that I'm sure it's going to edit and publish relatively soon. Uh, I think about next week. Uh, just about how to make uh, a really simple parametrically driven box for that. Uh, and because it's me, uh, <laughs> I can't make things really simply. I need to make them way over the top confusing um, and, <laughs> and a little bit extra. So it'll be a little bit more interesting than normal a normal boring Raspberry Pi case. Yeah, PC van, please. Yeah, and thank seriously. God you can buy it. Dude, that was that was tough. I mean, I want to say at one point they were yeah. trading it like three to four X. So a thirty dollar yeah, Raspberry like Pi was like hundred and twenty dollars. It was crazy. Oh. It was crazy we how actually, expensive uh, they got. When we were at uh, Maker Faire in uh, uh, about around San Francisco this uh, last summer, um, uh, they had a Raspberry Pi table, and the the CEO was there, and uh, and we went to dinner with uh, some of the guys there. And they were saying that there was this one, uh, this one person came over, not knowing who he was. I uh, just said, "Oh, this is like a computer thing." And he's like, "Yeah." And he goes, "Oh, <laughs> my grandson would love this. Uh, he does computer <laughs> stuff sometimes." And he goes, "Oh, really? That's that'll be really good for him." And just asking him like super duper simple, like, "Oh, does this work with the Mac?" Yeah, yeah. And being like super duper sweet about it. I'm like, "That's hysterical." That's I bet that happens man. all the time. It's like all these tech people where they go, oh, you, you know about 3D printers? It's like Joseph Prusha, and he's like, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I've heard of them. Oh my god, that's great. Um, speaking of, um, I, I the really P word. Dive... You said the P word. I said Prusha. I really want to get into this. Um, I know a couple of you actually saw our uh, my two hour live build uh, last week, which was live build. Live, live build. build okay so here's, here's where we make very all the faux pas where we use a drill to screw things in <laughs> okay i i just give me I liked a it. little bit i liked it you background. get all the credit okay yes all right fine okay so when i was in high school i ran my own uh, woodworking company where i used to make bespoke woodworking products for people anything you could do and i did it at a fairly cheap price because i was in high school uh ran it out of my parents garage and it was a ton of fun. I learned a lot about woodworking. It made me into a much better maker than if I had just done things for myself. Um, kind of made me appreciate my time, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I was making more than my friends who were working at like McDonald's and In-N-Out at the time, which was kind of cool. And, uh, and essentially while I was doing this, I was just saving up money. I'm like, I don't know what I'm saving up money for. I just know something's going to come. Uh, and I had like over a thousand dollars that I'm like, this, this is for something. I don't know what this is. And um, that was right around the time when... <laughs> yeah. Um, it was right around the time that the Prusa Mark III came out, which was... It was on the cover of Make Magazine for months. It was winning all of these awards. People were posting the crispest things. And it was just lovely. And it was about $1,000. 
I'm like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to buy my first 3D printer. I've been thinking about this for so long. <laughs> Finally can do it. And then at the last minute, I was about to click checkout and I went, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to put this in my savings lane. And so this is now my first Prusa. And it's a machine that I've coveted for a long time. And now I have one. And it's it's so it's a little special for me. Um, but uh, both Josh and I's first 3D printers was a oh a, a mono price mini mono price mini V2 V2 Select. That's what, it had a build plate volume of about that big. <laughs> it was tiny. It was, it was a, a plug and play. <laughs> it was so addictive to get. Um, it was fantastic. And then we very quickly upgraded to the end of three. And then we started to run classes on that uh, in person at our own workshop. And it just got, we just got faster and faster to the point where Josh and I can make uh, an end of three in probably about 15 minutes yeah. and get it like up and running just fine. Cool. So come, so <laughs> I was kind of thinking like, oh, this is, this is going to be on par with that maybe. I don't know. Doing zero research and saw the live stream and realize, wow, there's a lot of pieces Wow, there's a lot more pieces. Oh my God, there's 2,000 pieces. And someone in the comments said, yeah, this build took me like 10 hours to do. Like, oh wow, okay. Uh, I'm a professional though, so maybe I'll be able to speed run it. And then I looked through the instructions and it said, make sure you read every single instruction, not just look at the pictures. And that's when I went, oh. Um, so... I have a note about Not professional. Great. So, so okay. there's a there's a funny thing uh, when you say, "I'm a professional; it will be quicker." I remember having a conversation with a guitar maker at the shop that we were at, right? Yeah. And the and conversation exactly. was this: it was now that you've been hand making. I mean, he handmade the most beautiful guitars you have ever seen. They were they sold for flawless. They sold for like thirty thousand dollars and up. And he, I mean, he was like, he had studied Japanese craftsmanship from somebody, right? And so one day I said, you know, now that you've made a bunch of these, you must be getting a lot quicker. So how long does it take you to build one now? And he laughed at me. He's like, ha, ha, ha. I was like, wait, I don't understand what's so funny. He said, I'm not quicker. I'm slower. Because each that guitar that I make, I get more and more meticulous about the details of that guitar. And it takes me longer, yeah. not shorter and that always stuck with me is like we have this idea in our head that expertise leads to an increase in efficiency and actually for him and probably for you as well i think there's something similar what it leads to is a type of desire to have sort of the perfect product the perfect outcome and it takes I agree longer to, to build so when I as was you this, were jake so um so this printer uh we did not purchase uh this was gifted to us uh by a very good friend pooch um, who works for Prusa uh, that, that we've known for quite a while. Um, so massive, massive huge, thank you. Huge shout out um, to Prusa. He also gave Prusa us and the Prusa some, team. Uh, where is it? Uh, some, some filament. Some, some Prusa mints. Uh, incredibly <laughs> kind. Thank you ever so much to them. Very big uh, thank So you. I have spent much extra, t much more time than I, than I probably needed looking through every single instruction, making, I, making sure I did every single little thing as perfect as I possibly could. So the total time is that this took me, uh, I, I think this took me 12 hours total, including the live stream. And I can track that because I made it on my fairly small <laughs> desk, which I should have picked a larger workspace. Uh, took it into my dining room, which is uh, my, my dining table, a little bit more room, great. I could sprawl out a bit. And I dominated that for a couple of days. And it took me, uh, while I was building it, I just had a movie playing in the background. And I watched uh, Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, the extended edition, one of my favorite films. And then that finished and I wasn't done with that. I was like, oh, okay, okay. I'll play, I'll, I'll play Two Towers, extended edition. That went all the way through. And, oh, gosh. Okay. Uh, I'll have to play Return of the King, extended edition. Um, so three hours, three hours and four hours. So I think that the entire build took me 12 hours for a really solid, meticulous build. Um and I can say dun, 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 dun. This, this printer prints beautifully, but I think more importantly, the actual printer itself is incredibly high quality. Let's see it. Everything about it is 
really, really beautiful. It's quite heavy, so just <laughs> let me so, wobble it a little bit. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's funny because your camera's following you. So yeah, we can like kind of see it. It's like, whoa. <laughs> uh, this, this is a really, uh, this is a really, really lovely, lovely printer. It is very well made. But more importantly, as someone who does a lot of 3D printing, a lot of CAD, a lot of product development, every single piece in this, I was kind of noting just how clever every single design is. And I was reading through the manual last night. And they said that from their very first printer, they've always stated that every single component can be tweaked and changed in some way, um, improved essentially. So it's not just that the entire printer needs to be you know, redesigned, it's every single individual piece. They've kind of said, hey, this form factor and this type of printer works really well, and it does, uh, but every single part can be improved. And they said that from the M, the Mark III, 90% of every single part, 90% of all the components on here have been tweaked and changed in some ways. Yeah, this machine is lovely. Uh, I just did, I was very tired last night, so I just did a single print. This is with zero calibration on my behalf. This is just with the uh, standard stock material, the, uh, I think it's just the Galaxy PLA. Um, the first, I just printed the first layer, stopped it, and then peeled it off to take a look at it. It is immaculate, the perfect first layer. Um, I don't even, it's not going to show very well. There are layer lines on it. Uh, obviously, the Galaxy you can't really tell the layer lines, but there is zero elephant's foot, which is very surprising. It adhered perfectly, and the line distance, there is no gaps, and there's no bulging either. That balance is unbelievably hard to get, because either... You, your first layer doesn't squish down uh, that much, and then you don't get a good bed adhesion, and all of your layers are kind of squishing into each other, and they look a little sloppy, um, or you squish down too much, and then you get elephant's foot, and you have to do a bunch of post-processing or a lot of workarounds. Um, good lord, this is really beautiful. The top of the print, which usually is riddled with gaps on these fairly small texts. This is maybe eight millimeters tall really really gorgeous the layer lines are lovely um and i know this is their filament their settings their printer and they will obviously dial in the printer settings for this to be as perfect as possible um but that is still lovely and this took i think five minutes to print and this is obviously a dual color change so afterwards it went through this whole purging cycle where it would push your material out you clip it put a new one in it purges for you then it's like is it done purging or do you want to purge even more? Uh, under the LCD screen, it actually has floodlights. It's got gl uh, blue glowing lights. And as soon as it's done, it glows green. It's so extra and so lovely. Um, and I could really go on and on about this printer if you want. But I think the most important thing about it, which really surprised me, um, is that I started to get this kind of childlike giddiness about it. Which That's I what I was going to say. I have the time. text message from you that I was about yeah. to read was the giddiness that I was excited about. Yeah, which is, it's such a lovely feeling. So I think when everyone gets their first 3D printer, I think they they get really excited. It's like, oh my God, I have this new bit of tech. And then they and then they discover, and then they discover Thingiverse and they start to download a ton of stuff. And then they may realize, oh my God, there's a whole category on these 3D printer hubs about printing accessories for my machine. And people go ham on it. They print filament guides. They print spring feet. They print uh, filament guide bearing runners. They print different LCD, V-tracks. They do different colors. They make it totally unique. And it is the most fun and addictive portion of your 3D printing life. And it's so fun. And that was and getting that from the end of 3, it just is so much fun and so exciting. And it does have a bit of a childlike wonder. And since then, since our first Ender 3, obviously we've gone through a lot of printers and a lot of different type of printers. Some of them are more expensive, some of them are less expensive, some of them are bigger, smaller, faster, 
better quality, this, that, and the other. This one's Wi-Fi enabled. This one is direct drive. And it shows it goes on and on and on. And it has only been until this printer that I've had that feeling again. And that's why this feels this feels quite special uh, in a way that I really didn't expect. Uh, it's obviously a really lovely machine and I'm really planning on kind of diving into it, uh, especially into like Wi-Fi enabled so I can go directly from Slicer to my printer, wherever that may be. Uh, that's going to be a ton of fun. That's great. But the actual enjoyment of putting this together was so much fun. It was certainly a challenge, but it was lovely. And the actual enjoyment of having this machine is quite a new feeling which was we might have a new workhorse we might have a new workhorse yeah we'll Um, see tbd again this this printer was given to us or essentially donated to us uh by the people over at uh, prusa research so again massive thank you uh you guys rock incredibly generous i know how much these printers are thank you thank you thank you from the bottom of my soul um, I love this machine, and I have a printed just <laughs> one thing on it. That's how you know. Uh, and so I wanted Amazing. to spend a, a little bit of time uh, really quickly uh, just talking to uh, to some people about expensive 3D printers and that timeline of 3D printers. And this is something that I don't think a lot of people know about. Um, so this may be new to you, Josh. So I kind of want to have your input on it as well. Mm-hmm. So in the early days of 3D printers, the early day of desktop 3D printers, we were new to FDM technology. And so all the physical 3D prints that you would get off of it were trash. They were terrible. They were really ugly. They weren't very strong. The material science wasn't there. There wasn't a big enough of an audience for there to be really tremendous change in the industry. There wasn't an industry, really. And so you were basically asking hobbyists tremendously small market to spend sometimes three five thousand dollars on a machine that prints mediocre objects and that was a hard sell and so in the early days of kind of desktop 3d printers some of these manufacturers said okay we have to kind of throw in a bunch of extras and a bunch of additions that they're auxiliary to 3D printing. They aren't directly 3D printing, but they just make it look nice. And so they would have things like, oh, you can control your uh, your printer through an app or on very early smartphones, very early tablets, uh, or you can control it through a website. Oh, it has a camera in it that you can get, that you can check out anywhere in the world. And it was kind of a way to justify these high prices and distract you from the fact that you got not that great 3D prints out of it, but the fact that you got anything off of it. And obviously those kind of gimmicks went away because we started focusing on the 3D prints. Um, But then you got really, really lovely uh, prints out of it. Finally, people are now asking for, you know, these additions, which were commonplace. Now, if you buy a relatively inexpensive 3D printer, now people are expecting certain upgrades. They're expecting a BL Touch or a bed leveling probe, they're expecting strongest bed springs, they're expecting this, that, and the other. Um, but people aren't, but people kind of forget that we had this really like an inverted bell bell curve, where it's like we started off with a huge amount of tech in it, and then it went down to almost no tech, and then now it's going back up. Um, so really, really, really strange. So with this printer, you get a lot of the kind of goodies that come out of it based on the software and the whole ecosystem. But we're definitely coming up on the spike where we're still uh, expecting high quality prints with all of the uh, additional goodies that come with it. Those are just become, or they're becoming more and more default, which is kind of strange. Yeah. 100% agree. Yeah. I mean, you're seeing, yeah, I agree. We're seeing LIDAR, right? So I think the new bamboos have LIDAR. Is that what it is for the bed leveling for the 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 bamboo? That might be, yeah. I could be wrong about that. But but yeah, I 100% agree with you that we saw that, that kind of super techie thing all the way down to the bare bones how cheap can we Gimmicky. get this the, com- the commodity it, it, it was turned into to a commodity with the lowest possible price which is what got people into it and now we're we're kind of bouncing back to the other let's more tech heavy uh, and i would say we're, we're on a trajectory right now especially with bamboo and i think you'll see prusa entering 
more and more and more into this game too of the microwave mm -hmm. of 3d printers find the part you need online and just press go like that is what people have been like outside of the immediate industry outside of us nerds and geeks and people that like tinkering there's a huge world of people who don't really love to do those kinds of things but they would still love to be able to make something really quick and really easy and and not have to fiddle and tinker with the thing so i actually think the biggest trend, my prediction right here, I'm going to lay it out. My prediction for 2024 and then 2025 is going to be the uh, the reduced complexity of making a print on a machine to the point where it is press go on. And like, you know, Bamboo is already doing this where you can just press go on a print from their app store and it will send it right to your printer and print it without actually having mm -hmm. to do any slicing. So my prediction is that the increase in technology will continue. The prices will continue to be driven down so that it can be affordable for anybody, anywhere, anytime. And that uh, the com the complexity for the user and the user experience will just get better and better and better for those who don't want to tinker. I mean, going on uh, principles, which is, for you guys that don't know, it is made by Prusa. Um, if you look at their files, obviously they'll have the STL of the project, but they will sometimes have the G-code built ready to go for the i3, uh, MK3, the uh, MK4, uh, already pre-made. So in certain aspects, there is a little bit of a microwave printedness in the Prusa ecosystem, which is really great. Yep. Um, the other thing that I want to bring into that uh, is that their printers, I wouldn't say are microwave printers just yet. They're certainly lovely quality, but I don't think they are as, you know, go as... Uh, uh, some of the bamboo printers. One thing that I will say, though, that bamboo definitely isn't as good at is that their slices for the Prusa is definitely leaning towards more microwave printers. Uh, I used uh, Prusa It's a little bit. It's almost like a CAD time. infused. It's almost CAD infused. Yes, like there's is. CAD it functionality is. at a very basic level. Mm -hmm. There is. Uh, so I used Prusa slice for the first time last night. Um, hooked everything in. It, it was like, oh, what printers do you have? And he goes, well, you, uh, I have some, I have a few enders. And go, okay, well, go ahead and check all the different types that you have. Go, oh, great. Um, and then he said, okay, well, here's the diff here's hundreds of brands of different filament. Uh, and so I'm like, okay, well, I know all the filaments that I have on my rack, you know. So I'm just going to click that, and it's already been dialed in. And then here's a few different settings. It's like, do you want it to be structural? Do you want it to be quick? Do you want it to be beautiful and then of the different layer settings and just kind of plug and go and it does feel uh like the way to go there's obviously you can dive in deeper into the program and say you know i want to change you know really specific values which i'm one of those people that does um but as far as just a beginner coming into this and going i want to get up and go the prusa seems to be a, at least on the slider avenue kind of killing it really killing it actually they are killing it i think that they're investing a ton of time and energy and attention into that ecosystem as well and so we're right in the middle of filming videos for a cura course what is your thought on cura versus and i know we're just at the very beginning of the stage but what is your thought on cura versus the prusa slicer so i will say that the ui for cura is much better than prusa slicer with the caveats that it's more complicated or more complex. So if you have experience in 3D printing, I would say that it's uh, it's easier to change out some of the more advanced settings. Um, but if you're just coming into Cura as a, as a newbie, it looks really nice, it's very clean, it's very easy to kind of mess around with. Um, same question for the Prusa Slicer. I think the UI is a little bit more confusing if you're just getting into it. Um, but then as you build up more experience, then Prusa becomes great. And then if you then go past that and you were getting into the, you know, oh, I actually have a business centered uh, around 3D printing, then I think Cura starts to bubble back up as a serious contender. Uh, one thing that I will note is that I'm seeing Cura coming out with more printer slicing uh, updates and tools and tricks, which is obviously fantastic to see, but Prusa Slicer is coming up with more tools, tips, tricks, um, where, just as you said, it's almost emerging between CAD and slicing. For example, 
having a fairly complicated model, everything on my desk is a normal is a normal shape. Do I have anything weird? Yeah. Uh, if I have a metric tape measure, which is a fairly complicated you know, plastic mm -hmm. injection mold, and mm -hmm. I want to put some text right there on the curved part, that's not easy to do in CAD because it's analyzing every single facet uh, of that 3D model, and it's analyzing it very intensely. So that's that's pretty difficult. But then you bring it into something like Prusa Slicer, where it's not thinking of all the facets, it's just thinking it as a 3D object. Uh, then it's incredibly easy to, to emboss or deboss some text onto that surface. So I actually think uh, a good uh, a good section in our 3D printing book that will come out eventually um, is like saying where is what tools should you leave for the slicing or what tools should you do in CAD? Because I see a lot of people, they will spend enormous amounts of time trying to make something in CAD. And it's like, dude, you could make a simple box, pull it into the slicer. And then, uh, for example, uh, one of the shorts that we put out uh, last week was me making a little air tag credit card shape. Uh, and I just did a honeycomb uh, design in it just because I like honeycomb designs. I think they're cool. Uh, and one of the things that someone said is that, oh, you should have just made a solid box, pull it into your slicer software, said no top, no bottom, and then just make the hexa or the honeycomb infill. And I'm like, yeah, I totally could have done that. 100%. That would have saved me a good amount of time. Um, but that feature isn't available on Cura, as we all know. Cura, why don't you have honeycomb enabled? It's been 20 <laughs> years. Please, for <laughs> love of God. Anyway. Um, uh... But yeah, so it is. Uh, there's certainly a there's a certainly a lot of gray area where it comes to 3D printing, and I think if you do have the dough to sling around, and you're beginning into 3D printing, and you're certainly someone who loves kit builds, you like mechanics and building stuff, then I think the Prusa is top bloody notch. Uh, one thing that I'm Can't... sure you will say um, is that. It is quite a high price. This is about this is an eight hundred dollar printer, mm -hmm. um, not including shipping from the Czech Republic because they're only made um, in Czechia. And uh, so, if you want to buy cheaper printers, you absolutely could. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear. Just down there, I'm printing some parts out for a client. Can't hear uh, on end. Oh, that's fine. Uh, on an Ender Three V Three. Um, it is. I think we got it for like $160. It's usually $200. Just crazy cheap. Crazy cheap. And it is, it's got all the goodies that I want out of out of an Ender 3. I think we all know that. that it's got the goodies, but it doesn't make them giddy. Yeah. 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 It doesn't, it doesn't give me it doesn't give me the kind of oh, I'm the so feels. excited. It doesn't hit you in the feels. I know. If anyone uh, if anyone's a top gear fan, it doesn't give me the fizz. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. But the, but but this printer does, and I think there is something to say about that. That That's being amazing. said, that being said, um, if we were building out a printer farm, uh, and you can start print farms, you can start with one printer, then you get multiple multiples, and you realize very very quickly that you should make all of your printers the exact same, the type. same, <laughs> yeah, the same. Oh my god! Only buy one type of printer. Um, would you buy a handful? Let's say, would you buy four Prusas? Or for the same money, would you buy 16 Ender 3 V3s? It's a, it's a tough question. I think um, it depends on reliability. We'll have to test the MK4. But um, in the interest of time, um, I want to continue this discussion because I think you're going to learn a ton more next week. I want to make a couple of announcements. The first okay. announcement I want to make is... That's and the some people. Next week. We're here. That's a teaser. Yep. So uh, some some people here, um, we've just promoted to be uh, kind of server stewards, yeah. if you will. Uh, so some moderators. So PC Van Vliet uh, has agreed to help us moderate the Discord server. He's been incredibly active, making amazing stuff. Just a, a tremendous supporter of the community. So shout out PC Van Vliet. We'll do a little write up about you and your story and we look forward to seeing more comments from you and then we had one earlier as well and that is Joe Stree. Joe Stree has been making 
such amazing stuff, has been amazing interacting it's with the community and people. answering questions and welcoming people. And so Joe Street, we want to welcome you as a moderator as well. And then we've got one more guy who is not here, but he is actually helping us write three books as we speak. And his name is Ed Charlewood. Uh, and he's also agreed to help us moderate some on the forum. So we are, Jake and I are doubling down on the philosophy that uh, we're trying to make this a community. We're trying to support you all. And we hope we hope you feel inspired to come in and support other people in the in the way that we feel inspired to do that as well. And, so and welcome. Just, just, like, uh, just like our Fusion book, every time that we release any type of book, regardless of if it's a pamphlet or a skinny guide or a thick textbook, does it matter? We will always give away this content for free very very important we yep. will always make things as accessible as humanly possible obviously we'll sell the book and that's great to have physical i i like to have physical books and on that but note obviously obviously we want to make it accessible to everyone so that's it on that note i have in my head a goal for 2024 and i'm not sure it's okay. achievable but i'm going to put it out in the universe i want to try to give away 1 million copies of our book and I actually think it's pretty difficult to do it. So I'm going to be just thinking and as I walk and as, as you guys in the community have thoughts and ideas, please give away our book. We really desperately want people to have it. We spent a ton of time and energy and effort writing the best possible book we could. It's going to get a major update in 2024 with some new projects and all of the edits that you guys have suggested over the time. So help us give away books. All you have to do is refer people to the book page, to the download page they can grab it for free if they want to throw a small donation that's fine but the goal is print one it million out give books. it away one million books that's a lot of books jake that's a lot of books we yeah. gave away 12 yesterday that i know of for reference so we got a long ways to go so we're going to give away some books uh but huge shout out huge welcome pc van vliet and joe street if you are interested in being a moderator and you're active on the discord do send me or jake or both of us a note just say hey i'd love to help out um, we're not looking for too many more, but a couple more would be nice. We're, we're really just looking for people to help, you know, excite the community and, and welcome, welcome people and say hello. Uh, another thing which you mentioned briefly is that Jake has officially nailed the last short video. We, we're finally starting to crack the YouTube oh, code. You have over 19,000 views on your short making the contraption for your uh, time lapse rig. People seem yeah. to love it. So we got 19,000 views and tons of uh, tons of new traffic coming into the YouTube. So really, really well done, Jake. I know I so wanted we'll to embarrass you. We'll be making a lot more, a lot more goodies. There's totally a lot more goodies. Uh, but we'll, but um, we'll be making a lot more really good content, mini projects, which I love, uh, as well as lots of educational stuff. So if you guys want to learn more, stick around. And yeah, uh, I think we'll see you guys so next the, week. So not yet. So get out oh, of here, so Jake. Um, we have a couple more announcements to make. Just. Uh, two more things, I think. So we are going to be at DesignCon oh, in yeah. uh, Santa Clara, February 1st. I think that's Thursday, February 1st in Santa Clara. If you happen to be in that area, anywhere near that area, and you'd like to stop by, there is a free day pass for that conference, which is what I've gotten, just the free day pass expo pass. Uh, you can sign up and grab a free day pass and send us a note on Discord, email us, something like that. I would love to meet you guys in person. And in that vein, Jake, I had another idea, which I want to share really briefly here with our, Let's with hear. our, with the people on here, and that is, um, I was thinking maybe I would try to go up on a Wednesday before in Santa Clara. So if anybody here lives in that area, I would be interested in couch surfing the night before. I would love <laughs> to stay with somebody in our community that lives in that area. So if you know anybody in the oh, Santa Clara gosh. area, I will come up Wednesday night and I will crash Josh's on your couch, couch the entire on your floor planet, i way. miss Everyone couch surfing know. so all across much. america I all miss across it south so america much. all yes. across europe <laughs> yep I, I, anyway. I just love it so much so if if you or somebody you know happens to be in the santa clara area do send me a referral uh we got the moderators we got design con um did i miss any other announcements jake any other big announcements? So that's Design Con Thursday, February 1st. If you're in the Santa Clara area, um, please do send us a note and at least stop by and say hello at the conference. I don't need to creep on your couch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have one, I certainly will that night before. Uh, and that has been All right. the Cat Class, Class Podcast. Again, I'm Josh. We'll see you guys next week. And I'm we Jake. will see you all next week. You rock. Adios.
See you guys.